Hey, it's E.B. Moss, and this is episode 21 of Insider Interviews, season two, where you get the insider scoop on the business of media, marketing, and advertising. Now, this episode was recorded on the fly at the Streaming Media Conference in New York recently. I love these conversations because they are jam-packed. First, I spoke to Evan Shapiro, known as a media cartographer. Anytime Evan speaks, you want to listen. He has his finger on the pulse about the industry. So just about five minutes with him to kick off this episode, followed by Robert Tursek, who will give you such an interesting perspective on AI with so much detail, you're going to want to listen closely. I'll be following this next week with episode 22 with another five minutes from Evan and Braden Blacker, the digital native who is creating influencers already as a junior in high school. So episode 21 now from the streaming media conference. Hey, it's E.B. Moss. This is one of those ad hoc conversations. I know that you love me for these because when I find somebody smart at a conference, I like to grab them, sit them down and see if they will share some thought leadership. So the man you want to talk to is always Evan Shapiro, a media cartographer. Hello, Evan. Hi. How are you? (laughs) Good. Thank you for being very spontaneous, but I know your brain is always at the ready. Yeah, unfortunately. (laughs) So you're really kind of running the whole shebang here, the streaming media conference, and you're the MC. What, What are you seeing? What are you taking away? Talk to me about the conference. Well, what we wanted this to be was a collision of different points of view around honest conversations about the real problems the media universe is facing right now. Yeah. You know, having a conference and ignoring them is very old school, and we don't have the luxury of doing that anymore. Um, It doesn't mean we can't seek optimism. I think we've had a lot of really optimistic and visionary panelists and speakers, um, but we also shook up the format a lot. We wanted to create an ideas festival at the end of the upfront, at the end of uh, first quarter earnings season, where we could get together, gather, collide, be honest with each other about what's good and what needs to change, and figure out a way specifically for this group to collaborate. Um, you did. We, we had real debates with rules and timers and yep. points and the whole thing to kind of take down the walls around people who might be uh, uh, talking points guarded normally around topics and then we had a lot of one-on-one conversations where we were able to dive deep not just into where different companies are coming from right now but how they're doing it how they're approaching it what their cultural outlook is what the nature of leadership of these executives are Um, and i i'm really happy with how i think we've we've done that yeah i i I'm super impressed. And um, aside from the fact that you're wearing an Eagles t-shirt, shout out to uh, Jen Kavanaugh. Jen. Uh, Yay. Then one of the other moderators was wearing a Philly shirt. So, okay, it's all Philly all the time, apparently. Yeah. Um, So aside from debating on sports and things like that, there was also just a panel on brand versus demand or brand and demand and that was a lot of fun we heard people talking about the pros and cons of ai and i spoke to robert tersick um you also moderated a really great keynote a one-on-one with steve ellis the coo of paramount and cbs advertising what were some of your thoughts that came out of that i I really do think uh the notion of interoperability which sounds like this kind of general obvious thing to talk about now it's like synergy used to be um but i I wrote this story about the new nielsen gauge and in it it looked at the publishers across all media so it resized the world not by streaming or broadcast or cable Mm -hmm. but by all of that by publisher and paramount moves from down in the pack into the top you know three or four right with youtube uh, NBC d- does as well, and so, but that only works if you are truly interoperable. That only works if you can sell across Pluto, Paramount Plus, CBS, CBS Local, Paramount Cable, Paramount International, Paramount, you know, etc. And also 
Paramount's holdings on YouTube and yes. other social video platforms. Um, and so Steve, you know, over the last three years really built the operation under John Halley's and, and the management's their uh, direction for what that is now. And I know from firsthand experience that they really do act that way in the marketplace. Not everybody who's in that new pecking order does. Okay. And that, that I think what we learned there is that that's just now table stakes. If you're going to compete against Google and Amazon on the connected television, forget on social. Right. Forget on mobile. Just on connected television. If you're going to compete against YouTube and Prime and Freebie. Yeah. That's how you're going to have to operate. You're, there's no way to compete in any other format. So it's really the net net of networks <laughs> is really to um, be format agnostic, to be audience focused, to really approach everything kind of holistically and just do what's right for delivering the message wherever the target audience is. I think it's okay to, to have a hyper focus. So... For example, I think for Paramount and Comcast and Disco Brothers and Fox, that the focus should be on premium, on connected television. It doesn't mean you don't use mobile, but it's not the primary driver of your revenue. Um, and the reason for that is Amazon and YouTube are coming for connected television. Okay. Walmart is Rubble. coming for connected television, yeah. right, through Vizio. So you have to defend before you can go on the attack. And right now, the table stakes on connected television are connecting retail, Amazon, to premium video, Thursday night football, and a playoff game, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's why Peacock's move into the exclusive streaming playoff game makes a lot of sense. That's why NBC fighting Warner Brothers for N NBA rights makes sense. Yeah. Um, so... Once you can beat back the competition there, but that's a big if. YouTube is a monster. Right. It's the biggest television network on connected televisions on the planet in every territory. Amazing to think about it this way. And, um, and even for someone like Apple, if mm -hmm. they're going to be serious about doing connected television advertising, the, there's a window to win, that they have a right to win in. But you have to move fast. And the key is interoperability, measurability, flexibility, user-centric, um, and co when I talk about collaboration, the ability for players like Paramount and Disney and Netflix and Fox and Warner Brothers Discovery to collaborate around data yes, to improve the user experience so that consumers are not seeing the same ad a hundred times a day across all these different platforms so that consumers can personalize the experience wherever they go. The ability to not just have data clean rooms, but to create a first party data pool for the ecosystem that makes the ecosystem more usable for consumers and advertisers. If this group of companies fails to do that, they will get crushed oh. by the big tech people who are coming to, they're on connected television. They're already dominant on connected television. Um, and I hope that that message rings true. We have to be better at collaborating or the media ecosystem won't just change. I don't know that it's always going to change for the better. Mm. Well, you said we have to move fast to ensure our, There's a window. our CTV future. So I know that you only had a couple minutes to chat with me. So Evan Shapiro, I really appreciate brilliance in moving quickly. My pleasure. Thanks Thank so much. Thank you. I just got out of a session in which Robert Tursek of General Creativity spoke all about AI, but he has some chops, my friends, so I am super excited that I was able to grab him and he agreed to be on Insider Interviews. Hello, Robert. Hi, EB. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me on your podcast. Well, thanks for meeting me as well. I mean, you're a stranger to me, but I feel like I've been inside your brain for a second. <laughs> Well, we just had a lively debate here at the Streaming Media Conference in New York, um, and, and they asked us to make it a debate. You know, sometimes that's not nice etiquette, but in this case, it was, it was the assignment. The assignment was bring an argument. Yeah. And it was very polite, uh, but it was very lively. That's right. And the subject matter was artificial intelligence and media, and that's a very good topic for a debate because there's many points of views. You did, by the way, kind of kick off that panel with something a little controversial, but what led you 
to your confidence and your point of views? Because you've been around the block, Robert. Yeah, I've been doing this for a long time. So for 30 years, I've been designing and launching new digital services. And that's everything from streaming media services to TV networks and satellite and cable. And also 20 years of experience in the game industry. And I've done that all over the world. So I have some perspectives from different parts of the world. Uh, and so as, along the way, you know, I've gathered... I guess enough experience to sort of see how this game is played and, and what's likely to transpire in the near future. Yeah, I love some of the things you had to say. So you initially kind of created controversy on the panel by talking about um, copyright. You pushed back a little bit about that. Yes. So I would love for you to frame it up with that. Sure, happy to. So, so what are the most controversial topics regarding artificial intelligence and media today? And there's two, two big controversies that immediately come to mind. Everyone listening is going to be familiar with them. So yes. companies like OpenAI have introduced ChatGPT and their big language models called GPT-4. Um, and they're also partnered with Microsoft, who's rebranded it. They have a kind of like a productization right for the technology. They've rebranded as Copilot, and they're rolling that out, uh, integrated with about 60 software products. And, of course, their big competitor is Google or Alphabet. Uh, and just last week, they announced a, a flurry of new announcements. A lot of people thought that um, Google was on its back foot and kind of reactive and a little hesitant or timid about launching these things, which is ironic because Google invented the transformer technology that's behind all of these tools. Um, but now Google showed us that they, too, can compete. So there's sort of like a big battle happening in yeah. Silicon Valley. And the, at the heart of the battle is who's going to control search or maybe who's going to reinvent search. So that's, that's one area. But along the way, a lot of media companies, particularly uh, publishing companies, have raised their hands and said, hang on a second. It looks like you trained your large language model without permission on our copyrighted work. So that's one of the big controversies. It's not the only one. There's a second one, and it's probably bigger. Uh -oh. The bigger one is artificial intelligence is going to take everybody's job and we're all going to be unemployed. Now, I don't actually buy either of these arguments. I want your listeners to understand. I'm a little skeptical about both of them. And the reason I'm skeptical is that every time there's been a new technological advance that touches the media industry, the media industry always responds with moral panic. They always basically they frame it as a good versus evil story and they're always the good guy in the, in the narrative and the bad guy is always the, the, the company that's inflicting new technology on them. And I'm very skeptical about that story and I think your listeners should be as well. Uh, and by the way, I think that one of the examples that you gave, which I love and I definitely lived through, was, ooh, VHS and then DVRs <laughs> and right. all of those new Jack platforms. Jack Valenti went to Congress and said that the VCR, the video cassette recorder, for those who weren't around in 1984, <laughs> uh, he went to Congress and he said, very theatrically, he said, um, video, home video is akin to the Boston Strangler as it pertains to the me media industry. And Congress bought it. Like, he actually convinced them that this was, like, this evil thing. Oh boy. Now, notice what happened there, because they created this moral panic around the idea of a home video system until the moment the movie studios figured out that actually it was going to add a lot of revenue and very quickly became their largest source of revenue. Tens of billions of dollars were made from home video. So that was a giant unlock for the media business. And once they figured that out, notice that the moral panic vanished instantly. And that's how you can tell that's sort of a contrived uh, experience. Like it's not a really seriously held viewpoint. I think that same moral panic about artificial intelligence is equally contrived today. I see. What's behind it is pure economics. Uh, oh. You know, there, there are copyrighted works in question. Should those copyrighted works be used to train a large language model without consent or without compensation. That's the issue that's before the courts. So there okay. are 16 cases making their way through the legal system. I'm not going to tell you about all 16 of them. They're all a little different. Different companies are defendants. Different companies are organizations or artists are plaintiffs. So they're all going to unfold in different ways. And it would be foolish for me to try to predict what the courts are going to end up with. Um, but what you can say is at the core, they all involve the issue of is it fair use for a technology company to train a large language model, an AI, on copyrighted works without permission, consent, or any kind of compensation. Is it fair use or not? And of course, the plaintiffs all say it's not, that it's copyright infringement. The defendants all say, of course, it's fair use. They have 20 years of case history to support them because there's a very famous case called uh, Google versus uh, the Authors Guild. It was about Google Books, where they were taking snippets of books and copying them, literally copying them. 
Uh, and the courts there found it was fair use for right. Google to do that because it was a transformative use. They weren't using it to compete with those books. They were using those snippets to help direct search uh, results towards those books. Anyway, that's Arcana from 2005. But the point there is that the court, that, that case has been tested again and again and reaffirmed. Now, there's plenty of people who disagree with me. So just to be fair to the other people on the panel, there's a very strong case to be made that what's happening now with training large language models actually is infringement. I disagree with it, but there is there are two sides to this issue. It's uh -huh. a big controversy. But that said, I don't think either of these issues are the most interesting issues. I don't think the copyright infringement issue or the idea that AI is somehow going to displace all of our jobs, I don't think either of those are the most important issues. I think they're both dis distractions from what really matters. Okay. So the edge of my seat question is what are the biggest issues? Robert. So, thank you for asking. Dun, dun. Yes, dun, dun. after that setup, why not? <laughs> Let's jump right into that. So, so one of the things that's very easy to do when we talk about this new technology, or any new technology, is to come up with a dystopian scenario. You know, like, what's the worst case scenario that might happen? Which is what we're kind of doing. It's what everyone does. And in yeah. a way, Hollywood is to blame because for 40 years... Be yeah, very afraid. Ever since, you know, HAL 2000, you know, so, so for like 50 years... They've been training us to fear computers and robots and AI. You know, that glowing red eye. It's the same glowing red eye you saw in the Terminator. And then when they did the Matrix movies, it was a dozen glowing red eyes for the <laughs> Sentinels, right? So, like, that, that idea, that's, like, that's our... I'm not going to sleep tonight, you that, know. That's, yeah, that's the idea that's, like, embedded in our brain. Right. So we've been conditioned to think that artificial intelligence is this thing that we created. It's like the Frankenstein myth. We created this monster, and now it's going to come after us. Yeah. That's mythology, Okay. Humans have created tools since the beginning of humanity. It's what our economy rests on. It's what civilization rests on. This is just another tool. We haven't fully harnessed it yet. It's also far from perfect at this stage. It's in a very early stage. I'd say it's in its infancy right now. It holds great promise. It holds great potential. And of course it will have a disruptive impact, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Okay. So I'm just going to kind of thread the needle a little bit. Like I said, I'm trying to just be inside your brain. Um, so we started talking about media companies creating this kind of warning Will Robinson alert that the next new thing is going to be bad and disruptive and scary and it's going to change things for the, the negative. And then AI comes along and we're preaching fear and doom and gloom yeah. and yet it's still... Um, remains to be seen what it can do. We're only figuring it out now. Think about it, E.B., like if someone said to you, hey, here's this new thing, yeah. and it's really scary, and it's going to kill you, and it's going to take away jobs, and so forth, you, you certainly wouldn't embrace it. You wouldn't go after it and say, great, I want to learn all about this, right? You'd probably be pretty passive. And that's really a bad response, right? That's the wrong way to look at AI. My recommendation to people is, you should lean into AI. Right now is a great time to get smart about it. This is a tool that potentially can give you superpowers. It can confer tremendous advantages on people. But you're never going to learn about those advantages if you're paralyzed in fear and you're not doing and anything. you don't try it. There's a second reason why I reject that notion that the AI is going to okay. take our lives or take our jobs away, which is that it does a second thing that's also very, very disempowering. It creates a mythology around AI that it is somehow this superhuman godlike capability mm -hmm. that is controlled by a handful of people who know better and they have all sorts of advantages over us and so on. And that too causes you to be passive. When you hear about that, you feel powerless. And as a result, you're yeah. unlikely to embrace it. This isn't the right way to approach the future. I think the right way to approach the future is to say, I want to get curious about that and understand does it live up to the hype? Does it live up to the potential? Can I use it in productive ways? Is there a thing I can do with it today that I couldn't do yesterday? And if that's true, that's not harming me. That's not taking anything. That's conferring some advantages on yeah. me. I think every person listening to this could adopt that approach. And you have to set aside all that doom and gloom we've been conditioned to believe from all those movies and all the rest of it. And start to think about the question of how might this serve us? How right. might this might make life better? So yeah. let's let's talk about the positive aspect of artificial intelligence okay. right now. And we're talking specifically here about generative artificial intelligence, which is a little bit distinct from the kind that we've had in the past, the predictive models or the, the analytical AIs, which we've had for 30 years. Those are not new. 
Um, by the way, we use those technologies every single day. So when you use your iPhone, mm -hmm. you're using artificial intelligence, whether you're doing a Google search with autocomplete or you're using Google Maps to do turn-by-turn -turn directions, or if you're on social media looking at your news feed, or you if you're doing check. a translation, exactly. Uh, when, you, you know, when your camera unlocks, that, that facial recognition is a form of artificial intelligence. Uh -huh. And a lot of people don't realize this, but if you have any of the last three generations of iPhone, when you use the camera app to take a picture, you're using artificial intelligence. There's a ton of AI built into your Apple iPhone like that what? enhances your photographs. How? Uh, so there's a neural engine there that will detect edges and distinguish between what's in the foreground and what's in the background. It can detect faces. It can detect skin tones. That's why you can do search on objects in the oh. pictures. That's all artificial intelligence. That's done in your phone when the photo is taken. Now, that's not all. Okay. With an iPhone in specific, the minute you launch that camera app and hold the camera up, before you even click on that red button to take a picture, it automatically takes eight pictures. Which picture, and then of course you take your picture, so there's yeah. nine pictures total. Which picture is the one you took? You don't know the answer because the phone picks the one it considers to be the best. Damn it. And I you think you're good you think you're a good photographer, but that's a really great illustration of how these tools actually are going to work in real life. Okay. We won't use them unless they make us feel like we're superstars. And if they make us feel like superstars, it feels totally natural. I feel like I'm a great photographer yeah. when I use my iPhone, right? Okay. In fact, I'm not the author of that. I'm sharing the authorship with a machine. Now, as nutty as that sounds, and I know it'll come to a shock to some of your listeners to think that I'm sharing authorship with an AI, but I think that's going to be increasingly true for the next decade or two, that we're going to start to get this new concept of blended authorship. And part of it is borrowing from or learning from the work of other people who went before us. But oh, that's how artists have always worked. Coming full circle to the copyright aspect and trading this on... This is the whole point of copyright, oh. is to enrich society and to equip us with the learnings of other people, the intelligent insights of other people. They're allowed to you know, dominate that or m monopolize yeah. that for one generation. And after that generation dies, it reverts to the public domain and it becomes the property of everyone. That's how Got it's it. worked for 300 years. Okay. And now, of course, our media companies have tried to extend that right in time. Yeah. So now we have basically perpetual copyright because it's the author's life plus 70 years. Well, that's like 100 years, right? That's a very long time. But that's not all. We've also extended copyright through the concept of derivative works. You know, when copyright was originally introduced, it only pertained to that one work. So if you wrote a book in English, that manuscript in English was your protected work. If yes. someone translated into French or German, that was not part of your rights. That really? was a different work. Oh, I see. Because it was a different work. It was translated to a different... And it was very okay. practical, right? It was a very practical concept. Over time, in a lot of case law, it was determined that derivatives from that original work are also covered by copyright. So we extended it in that dimension, and that's not all. We've also added a lot of media formats. In the United States, when the first copyright law was passed... Uh, it covered books, of course, maps, and charts, and that was all. And then, of course, over the ensuing century, as more and more media formats were introduced, copyright is extended to all those media formats. The main point here is simply that we have 200 years of experiencing copyright expanding in every dimension over time, across different formats, and across derivative works. That's been our experience. We've been conditioned to that our entire lives. And in fact, in the last 50 years, we've had a massive expansion of copyright. What that means is actually... What we own, if you're not an author or a painter or an artist who creates works, what you own, what we all own, is the public domain. And the public domain has been drained of original works. And the original intent was one generation gets to keep the work and monetize it, and then it reverts to the rest of society forever after that, becomes part of the public domain. But what's been happening is private companies have been draining the public domain of fresh work. So today, if you want to get public domain works that you can freely iterate on and use and copy and you know, remix and rematch and do whatever you wish, you have to go back to 1923. That just seems inherently wrong. Wow. Right? So if, if we had the same copyright law today that we had more than 100 years ago, all of Star Wars would be in the public domain. All of Marvel would be in the public domain. Right? So... That would be a radically different concept, and actually much more recent works as well, because it was only original term was only 14 years. If you could quote works that, were, that came out just 14 years ago or even 20 years ago, I think it would be a very different society, one where more people participated, more people were able to remix and rematch. Those works would be much more vital. One of the reasons why the movies that come from Hollywood and the music that comes from the record labels today seems so formulaic and so boring to us 
is that this very tight control over who gets access to use the work and who has the rights to remix work and so forth. If it were a little more flexible, the way it used to be in the past, more people would be able to participate and comment from and remix and rematch and mash up the works of the past. So part of my view here is that the people who are complaining about artificial intelligence and training, they're trying to defend their monopoly. These are the copyright mafia, if you will, that have these incredible rights. They've been responsible for this massive expansion. And when we think about, well, who's really being harmed here? I think society suffers more from works being held in a private monopoly for 100 years than society suffers from the training of an artificial intelligence on copyrighted work. Obviously, that's a contentious viewpoint. And on the panel I was just on, we heard both views, so I'm not going to try to yeah, recap the, the other the point starving, of view. The starving artist perspective. and uh, the We always hear about that. Do you know there's no concept of artist rights in U.S. copyright law? That's a French well, concept. Well, that was the other thing that you brought up, which I found fascinating. People always go to that. They always go to these sentimental or moral arguments, because if you look at our copyright laws in the United States, they're purely transactional. So we have a notion here. It's fundamental in our copyright law your rights as an artist in your work are alienable meaning you can sell the work like a commodity to a publisher to a record label to a movie studio and in fact if you work in those businesses very often that is what happens effectively you confer your copyright to that company at which point it becomes their property to manage that's a commodity there's no artist rights i'm sorry (laughs) i was not going to talk about copyright i wanted to talk about the great uses for ai and how it can revitalize culture and expand imagine this most most people do not feel they're creative. Most people do not feel that they're very expressive, right? Yeah. Most people don't consider themselves good writers, good musicians, or good artists, right? So you have a mass of humanity that does not feel like it's able to activate its expressive potential. That's latent potential in humanity. But now, with ChatGPT and with MidJourney and the other generative tools, much easier than going to art school or writer's school, uh, relatively easily, you can start to unlock your creative expressive potential with the aid of an AI assistant. Now notice what I'm saying here. I'm saying it's the human working with the AI that unlocks that creative potential. I'm not suggesting that we delegate the entire project to the AI. If you've used any of these tools, you know exactly what I mean. I do, and uh, all right, I I think that there's a difference between very optimistic and dystopian, and I think the truth is somewhere in the middle, but go on. Okay. Well, here's the point. Half of humanity is below average as a writer, right? If ChatGPT can make that half that considers themselves below average, if they can just raise their writing skill a little bit, that's a net win for humanity, right? We're talking about 4 billion people who will suddenly have greater expressive capability. And for those of us who have to read the stuff... Net loss for E.B. Moss. Okay. In what way? Now, tell me how you're losing. I want to know. Well, okay on the panel with you was Carissa Price and she put up a slide that said that only 25 to 35 percent of jobs will be able to be done by AI versus those that are more creative and human driven. I certainly have been aided in you know creating a title or polishing my work or whatever but as a writer it puts the fear of God in me that now you know, if I am above that 50% threshold in my skills and I think genius ability as a writer <laughs> and everybody else is now catching up and evening the playing field, what does that mean for my craft? Okay, so it's a reasonable question and now we're right back at the beginning of the conversation where we talk about the fear that AI is going to eat your job. But I don't think that's likely to happen in your case. You were just talking about yourself. Because you're a naturally curious person. You have the ambition and the drive and the get up and go to get out there and do interviews with people. I mean, you're, Especially you're, those I've never met before in my life and never prepped with. There's no AI <laughs> that's going to replace that, right? That's, that's a unique skill given to you, right? But also, there's your human curiosity, you, that intellectual aspect of you that causes you to push, ba- push past the superficial and obvious stuff and probe a little bit deeper and try to uncover those nuggets, right? You, you came to me a moment ago talking about some of the things that I said that you wrote down, right? That's also unique to you, and that's not something that AI can do as well. So let me point out, you're actually the perfect example of a professional writer who's using these tools in ways that enhance her skill set, but you're not disrupting yourself and you're not displacing yourself. In fact, you're making yourself... On the other hand, we could probably say, um, is generative AI likely to replace you as an author entirely? I, I think that's highly unlikely. So it's unlikely to me that you 
as a professional writer are likely to get replaced. Same is true for screenwriters. I know last year the Writers Guild was very, very concerned about artificial intelligence. They were not so concerned that an AI would replace them in terms of writing a good script. What they were very concerned about, and I think they were right about this, is the AI would replace them with a lousy script, like a really low-grade script. There was a loophole in the existing agreement that could have permitted an unscrupulous producer to do something like this. Here's a scenario. I'm going to invent this. This is not what the Writers Guild said, but this, here's my imaginative scenario. You can imagine a producer driving in from Hollywood, calling an assistant in the office saying, I got an idea for a movie. I need a summer buddy cop movie that takes place <laughs> in South Central, and it's going to be a white cop and a black cop, and they're going to be driving around, and one of them's a rookie. But we have to have something fun in there, so add like an alien or some sort of like, you know, supernatural presence in the thing. And can you have ChatGPT generate that and have it on my desk by the time I get to the office? <laughs> and then the guy rolls into the office, and here's a freshly generated script, right? This is the nightmare scenario. And of course, it's not good because it's uh -huh. generated from an AI, so it's just an average right but here is a script a first draft script and then at 11 o'clock there's a lunch with a professional writer and that unscrupulous producer might then say hey we want to hire you to do a rewrite because we got the script in we think there's some potential here but it's not quite good enough well the price of that rewrite according to guild rules is about 25 percent of the price of doing an original script and this is the exact scenario that the Writers Guild was concerned about. It wasn't so much about the AI, it was about giving the unscrupulous producer a way to kind of work their way through or around the rules. Yeah. And that's clearly not right, right? And it wouldn't lead to good work, wouldn't get good outcomes, but mainly it's just they were worried about getting undercut yeah. in this way by an unscrupulous producer. Now they've closed up that loophole, so that won't happen again. Uh, that They're not allowed to use AIs for original material in that way. So that's interesting about writing, and that alleviates part of my professional career. But the other part of my career is voiceover. And yes, thank you for the compliment about being a good interviewer. But um, there are also synthetic voices now and all of that kind of thing. And the other strike was the actor's strike. And, you know, requiring actors to sign away iterations of their voice, for example. Right, that was their nightmare that. scenario. That's that, right. That, so that, I, yeah. I have multiple nightmares. Okay, well, let me address those two <laughs> things. So there, you Please, brought up two. I feel better on one. You, you brought up two. So... Um, with the screen actors, the concern there was that they might be forced to sign a contract that would allow a studio or a producer to use their name and likeness or their voice yep. without consent in the future. And, and for people who are listening who are skeptical about that, let me assure you that's possible. Like that's very, very likely. If mm -hmm. it's not possible to do it perfectly today, it will be within a matter of months. So that was not an unfounded fear. It's just like the writers. There was a very legitimate concern there. Uh, and again, the new guild contract makes that expressly prohibited. Um, it doesn't mean that they won't be able to do it. They'll just have to work a deal for that. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you right now, the major talent agencies are very focused on this. Not as a negative. They're focused on, well, what might the potential here be? And think about a few scenarios. So provided that that artist is compensated for their use of their name and likeness and so forth, here are a couple things that might actually make sense. Very often, artists can't travel or they can't go to Kosovo for six weeks to make your movie, right? They might do it for a week, but what if that director needs a reshoot? Or what if a scene didn't work out? Or what if they just need a reaction shot or something like that? You can envision a scenario where they might get the right to use the AI likeness of that performer to do the reshoots and so on. That would be a win for everybody because the artist would get paid, uh, the film would get finished, they'd be able to fill in the shot. And let me assure you, if you've ever spent time in an edit suite, the number one problem editors have is they're always like, yeah, what's there was a, right. a reaction shot or something else, right? So it, that comes up pretty frequently. That's a scenario where an AI likeness might actually solve a problem. Another one, this is a little creepier, but it's a possibility people are thinking about. Artists and performers who are no longer alive. You know, so could you put Elvis and Marilyn Monroe in an action movie with Brad Pitt or something we like that? We kind of have seen something I, like that. I, I think, first of all, there's examples of that, right? The mm -hmm. famous uh, Tupac Shakur appearance right. at Coachella, which is almost 20 years ago at this point, which was up the to the point they went on stage. Dr. Dre, the producer, was worried that the fans might not like it because it wasn't authentic. Turns out the fans loved it. Mm -hmm. They loved it. And other artists like Madonna have attempted to do this as well people like it. So this is an interesting thing. Fans are not demanding authenticity in the way that performers or their management might think. True, but fans some have, have wanted to marry some uh, 
They have. <laughs> they have. As a matter of fact, as a great anecdote, you're right to bring it up. There's a, a, um, a virtual performer named Hatsune Miko in Japan, yeah. and she is a software that was developed for um, a voice synthesis tool that Panasonic built a few years back. The voice synthesis means that you can type in some text and it'll sing the words. And so people were writing songs for this voice synthesis. And there were some 10,000 songs and the fans, they wanted to see this person singing, not just hear the voice. And so they designed it. It looks like a Japanese anime, of course, right? Because it's in Japan. Hatsune Miko. Well, then, of course, fan demand was we want to see her perform in concert. And when she performs... How many people do you think would actually show up to see a computer-generated artist sing songs that are synthetic? Oh, my. The answer is she routinely sells out arenas of twenty-five to 35,000. She does it all over the world. She's enormously popular. And when she appears on stage, she's 30 feet tall, so she's also a giant anime character. I know that sounds crazy, but it gets even weirder. Uh-oh. Uh, before the pandemic, a, a single Japanese guy decided to marry her. Yes. And he spent a couple thousand dollars on the wedding, and his family was quite upset. But he had a very well thought through reason. It made sense to him, at least, for, for why he chose to do this. But what most people don't know is that 1,500 other people also married Hatsune Miko. So people love this stuff. <laughs> there is a kind of crazy desire to have your alter ego or your life mate in the form of software. I'm not going to comment oh, on whether it's humanity. good or bad because this is, yes, <laughs> this is like, this is outside the scope of our conversation. Right. It, but it's fascinating, it, right? It is. And it's it, opportunity. And I want to uh, just kind of wrap it up a little bit because on Synthetic Voice, in my last episode with John Rosso, who is at Triton Digital, we talked a little bit about that as well. And he gave the example, the advantage of being able to iterate on language as well. Yeah. So it's a company in 88 countries and so they're able to do cross communication and interpret and you know revise content in the voice of Spain of you know Romania of whatever it is and so there's excellent use cases for synthetic voice and breaking down barriers to communication I'm glad you put it that way that's not a topic I'm as familiar with it is a real issue so voice rec- voice talent is almost certain to become replicated by AI. And so there are the issues I think are whose rights are, whose voice is it, is the artist going to get compensated fairly and so forth. My hunch is that that's probably going to get sorted out. But you point out a very good thing. Like right now, very few voice artists can give you voiceover in 25 languages. But with the AI tools that are available today, this is not science fiction. This is around right now. You can easily do that. Yeah. And that's not all. If you are interested in knowing what's coming next, I recommend that you go check out Microsoft's new software. It is called Vasa One, V-A-S-A One. And it shows you how you can generate synthetic dialogue, lip sync, Mm -hmm. between two synthetic characters. And then you can instantly language localize that for some 20 different languages around the world. Meaning a producer can shoot a film, but not in one language. They can produce simultaneously multiple language versions. Why might that be important? Well... Some languages, say, for example, Spanish or Russian, have more syllables in a sentence than English. So if you shoot the movie in English Mm -hmm. and the scene is only a few seconds long, then when they dub it in the other language, they have to, like, speed it up or change the dialogue, which might change the story a little bit. In the example I'm giving you, if it's generated, then you'll be able to generate a scene. It might be a few seconds longer. Um, but you'll have it properly translated into that language, so it's going to read better for that audience. Look, these are all fine nuances. As you can start to see, though, when you probe past the fear and doom scenarios, yeah. you start to see there's some creative potential here, and it's not all negative, and potentially some of it is very positive. You could do things you could never do. This is why I say it gives us superpowers. Well... Thank you so much, Robert, because I think I might actually sleep well tonight now. (laughs) I'm so glad to hear that. (laughs) Thank you very much for being so spontaneous and letting us um, get a little insight into AI. Uh, that, That was amazing. Great fun talking to you. Thank you, Evie. I'll be following this up next week with episode 22 with another five minutes from Evan and 17-year-old wunderkind Braden Blacker, who is already, as a junior in high school, working full-time creating influencers using his digital native chops. So to wrap it up, just a little reminder that a good podcast doesn't have to be hard. 
but it ain't easy. I can help you launch yours, market yours, or host yours. And if you want to support this fabulous free content, you can find me at buymeacoffee.com slash mossappeal, truefans.fm, anywhere on social media, and reach out at mossappeal.com. And a big shout out to John Clayton for the theme music. But truly, thank you for listening, learning, and sharing insider interviews with me, E.B. Moss.